Hello, and welcome to what is the, uh... Well, something I hadn't expected to be doing. Um, honestly, I hadn't really thought about how I was going to do. Which is the common response to the Christmas videos. So, there have been a lot of comments. Let's just leave it at that. There have been a lot of comments. A lot of comments. And I am hopefully going to be able to answer them all. He says, as he's quickly as he, uh, moving, this thing has lost him where he was. Give me a second. Found it. So, Raymond Sommerfeld, regarding the HIPAA class, the SN built the Brooklyn class on roughly 10,000 standard tons ton stand displacement. For 16,000, the Germans should have been, uh, should have been, it's always nice when someone says should have been, uh, able to build a ship with fire, a 15 6-inch gun and some decent arm protection, or perhaps 12 8-inch guns. It makes me wonder why everyone thinks so highly of the German heavy cruisers and capital ships. Well, as Snibby Webby, that's a cool name, basically said, it's the same reason the people hype up the German big cats. The I uh, the problem is when you're fighting someone. If you make out your opponent is the weakest thing since sliced bread, then a it makes your victories look rather hollow, and b and this is even more problematic, it makes any losses look rather stupid and absurd. So you have a small problem. You either hype up your own enemy, or you look weak. And no one wants to look weak when they're fighting a war. And the trouble is, it's not the fighting power of the German ships which is really the problem. It's their position, and it's their very existence, and the fact that they can fight compared to merchant ships. This is the problem. This is the reason why you have what you have going on because it's the Royal Navy has to be where it is and the US Navy took sent in the North Atlantic when they when they're supporting there because of the impact those ships could have on merchant vessels and convoys if they come out but the trouble is the force you have to sustain to be able to watch because they can pick when they come out but you have to always be ready for them to come out so you need far more ships than they do you can't justify that on a realistic appraisal of the enemy ship's capabilities 1v1. Because 1v1, theoretically, your own heavy cruiser should be able to match in, and 2 should be enough. But to guarantee two heavy cruisers being available to fight the one German heavy cruiser requires you to maintain probably a force of at least 6 in that area. Well, hang on, the Germans have got a few heavy cruisers, and they've got a few capital ships, and what happens if a combination that comes out? Oh, sugar. And you have to guarantee you can sink it. You can't afford for them to have a lucky shot because, as the British had learnt to their fault in the, during the war, the Germans can have a lucky shot and you can lose a battle cruiser. Which is annoying. Terrible for the crew, annoying for the Royal Navy. Spencer Jones. Is it me, or would the Germans have been vastly better off had they based the Königsbergs and Leipzigs largely off Emden's originally intended design, with more modern engine tech to boost the speed a bit and ditch the idea of using diesel engines for a central sh any central shaft, and ideally ditch the free proper arrangement in general and use either two or four shafts? Also take advantage of the fact that with them being allowed to use standard displacement as a measurement of displacement, they'd have ha they'd have seven hundred tons more to play with in terms of adding more stuff. Even without any cheating, certainly the edited product could have been and couldn't have been worse than the actually produced designs. It's an idea, as you say. We don't know what the final design would have been, and that's the trouble. German design procedure is interesting. It's interesting, and there are that that saying: "Too many cooks can spoil the broth." Well, when it comes to German warship design, it's not too many cooks. It's too many departments who don't know about cooking. It it's kind of a case of it's like the you have a chef who does know about cooking, but they're just one member of a committee, 
along with a lot of people who have no idea how to cook. And actually, some people who are not anything even to do with the restaurant. And some people who are just... Just... Just there. Just there. They, they have no reason to be involved in this part of the process at all. They should be... The, the sort of the people who are supposed to be in the role level of... We would like to have more warships. Cute. Thank you. We will tell you what warships are probably sensible to have. Uh, they're trying to get involved at a level of... Oh, but this ship should have this many guns and this... And it should be arranged in this way. And the thing is... People at that level are not supposed to get involved a lot because they have none of the competency or skill to be there, but they have such a power and status, you cannot argue with them. Constructively. It's life. But it's a problem for them. It is a problem for them. And um, what I have to admit, what I'm doing is I'm literally just working back through the comments I've received over the Christmas period. They are going to be comments from different videos. And because there were just so many of them. And I would have been doing videos on comment response videos f for weeks on just the Christmas ones and not because I thought I'd catch up this year. And I've seen what's happened to one of my colleagues who does that. He does it very well. But I see his backlog, and I askew the idea of generating such a backlog. So I am going to deal with them in a series of videos of Christmas comment response videos. And if I get to your comment in it, I, I thank you. And if I don't get to your comment, I apologize. But I will try and get to everyone's comment. Still what tea kettle potato. A, cool name. B, I'm sorry, sir, your ship has battleship spectrum disorder. I probably shouldn't be admitting I found that funny, but I did. I, I probably shouldn't be, but it did make me giggle a bit. Mainly, and this is someone who is on the dyslexia spectrum thing, so I uh, so you know I can say I I have a sort of thing of where, mm -hmm. but no, it made me giggle because as I've said it, kept trying to point out, it is a spectrum from your battle cruiser, battle cruiser, as in two words, to your battleship. And there is a fast battleship and there's a battle cruiser, one word, in there. And sort of on the points and as it goes together. From a thing which is basically firepower and speed, out of the emphasis, to something which is in the trying to be in the centre of that firepower armour speed triangle. My cover, uh, Cavalera, I have a reprint copy of the Imperial Russian Navy by Fred T. Jane from 1904. The book provides a thoroughly British perspective on the qualities and shortcomings of the Russian ships and men. It's also a far politer copy of a book, uh, uh, far politer in its text than some of the actual estimates that the Royal Navy produced on their Russian counterparts. Sage Ninety would love to see you trying to pronounce Tompkins' full name. Can they ask Pomp Pompkin Chavashki? Tereski. Uh, my response was, don't be that cruel, and then I tried to do it. I said, Lou, I'm sure in the next five year Soviet plan, the Soviet leadership will correct all mistakes. They tried. These are, of course, from the 1918-1939... Uh, part one of the Soviet Navy video. Mm -hmm. No, you do expect a Stalinist Inquisition. Ah, uh, fight for a global First Amendment. Hello. Uh, the USN has just been caught covering up drinking water contaminated jet fuel after someone hooked the fuel hose up to the fresh water for, for, for minutes on the US and Emmets. They told the sailors it was okay to drink, so they posted the pictures of black, green, uh, grey and green water. As Marcus Francisonium kindly points out, this is actually not the first time they cover up something. 
Also, a bit of a made-up story. It's impossible to attach a fuel hose on a portable drinking water bunker station. One, fuel bunkers have a different connection. Two, the pipes are different size, and the fuel is pumped in a much higher volume and pressure than drinking water. And if it's at, it's at sea, they use NATO B probes or NATO A to refuel or replenish other ships. Avcat F44 has a distinct spell, not very pleasant, and every engineer knows this. And rule one of all ships is the en if the engineers stop drinking coffee or tea, you might want to stop drinking yourself. Also, if in the drinking water, it would be at the sho in the showers as well, and the galleys as well. And if there was Avcat F44 in drinking water tanks, the tanks must be cleaned and completely recoded, as that stuff will stay in those tanks, contaminating the water for years to come. Well, yeah, Max Roman, please check out the channel by an ex-USN submariner called Subbrief, where he covers it with evidence from sailors aboard. As Hansonian points out, the only way it can happen is deliberate sabotage. They, uh, they, and I would agree from, and I have to say this from my own experience, I haven't, I haven't actually done a close ex inspection of those particular pipes, but in my own experience of looking at pi of the pipes I have inspected on various ships, they are usually designed to be very different from this perspective to try and make it, well, I wouldn't quite say idiot proof, but very difficult for this to happen. There is a lot of protection put into it. We will see. We will see. Jack Ray, lol, we need more named that Russian commander hosted by Dr. Alice Clark. Please don't. No. No. Derek Kerb, I'm care for the comedic Navy incompetence. The Soviet Navy 1918 to 1939 wasn't terribly comedic in its incompetence, it was just... Mostly every time it was trying to achieve competence, someone decided to kill the people who were trying to achieve competence. Um, Og Scarlet, uh... A lot of competence, uh, the credit has to, go, has to be given to Rozenski, uh for even making it past the Cape in regards to your mention of Toshima. The man had a temper, yes, but he always made huge efforts to train his crews properly. <laughs> the only thing stopping him from letting his temper out on officers who were cruel to the enlisted ranks, or generally misbehaving or disrespectful and insubordinate to him personally, or in some cases revolutionaries, was the fact that a lot of the officers had connections to the Imperial Russian court, and as and well as Drakenfell Abdi said, that's one way to end your career very quickly. My response was agreed he was a kind officer, not a spectacular one, but definitely a competent, understanding professional. Colonel Overkill then responded, Yes, the floating doom of binoculars. Also, I have to respect the fellow for not having an accidental and repeated discharge of the entire fleet's armament in the general vicinity of Kamkatcha. Uh, Kamkatcha. Uh, I honestly don't know if in, in the same position I could uh, claim the same or resist the temptation to board and execute the captain at a minimum. You have to remember it's a very different scenario than the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy has got to the point where the Admiral is God in the 1890s. And the Admiral in command, even Beresford and Fisher, if Fisher gave an order as his senior officer, Beresford would not dare disobey it. Because the Admiral was God. In the Russian Navy, it's still very much connections orientated. And there's this classic scene in Sharp, actually, in the TV series, where a really annoying and terrible colonel is being lectured by Wellesley. And he says to Wellesley, I have friends at court. And Wellesley responds, A man who loses the king's colours loses the king's friendship. And goes on with, I shall help you be a hero, and you can either cower in Whitehall, or you can be a hero in Portugal, Spain. I will help you be a hero in Spain, sort of thing. 
this is still very much court influenced. And yes, there are court influences in the Royal Navy, etc. There are. But Rosensky had to put up with far more the things the officers in the Russian Navy could get away with versus the things the Royal Navy officers could have got away with is very different. And it's sometimes I read histories of the Royal Navy, uh, histories people put out and sort of they talk about the Royal Navy and they talk about them doing things and I go, that I, I look into it and no, it wouldn't happen. One of the favourite things is the recently as I've seen, a, I was reading a magazine article and it conflated the press with slavery. And I can see the point. I can see where it comes in, but it's actually slightly different. It's... The, the, you might be pressed, but you still got paid. You still got fed and still had rights. You were impressed by the Royal Navy, but you still had rights. Strangely enough, as a sailor. He was still protected and entitled to prize money and all sorts of things. So it's very different from being, let's say, a slave. But I can understand, because you don't go willingly, why people can put it in the same category. But in, in even in that time, if an officer fed his men as badly as some of the Russian officers tried to feed their men, that officer would have been got rid of. Possibly by the men. Probably by his peers. Because you didn't do that. If you were found to be shortchanging your men in food and grog, there was a very quick way to get yourself out of the Royal Navy. At any point in its history. Geo guys, here's the one. So what was the bigger hindrance to the creation of Stan's big fleet? The Great Purge or the lack of infrastructure? Uh, lack of infrastructure. Well, the answer to this is six of one and half a dozen of the other. Because on the face of it, it's the infrastructure, but every time someone starts to fix it, they end up getting a very bad case of lead poisoning. That's literally what happens. It's very rapid, it's very quickly debil debilitating, and, um, debilitating, and it, uh, basically it's overwhelming and they're gone. It's rough sad. Howling Rock. Rook. I avoid being wham for about a decade, and then Dr. Clark's sense of humor happened. Well, now you know, you have a very small idea what it's like to be in the Soviet Union. You got whammed. Nicole Ross. What would I have built? Well, this was a comment on the Admiral Hitler class. Uh, from 1935 onwards, I would have built no cruisers. They would be fairly useless against the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy has too many cruisers, and we just hunt them down. I'd make one long-range supply sub for each pocket battleship to resupply ammo. That's got to be a massive sub to supply ammo to a pocket battleship. I hit the heavy cruisers of the 11-inch variety. Uh, I would build one subversive supply ship for each, po each of the aforementioned ships. I would legitimately flag them as a US probable neutral that Brim would think twice before boarding. The flotilla, well, I presume that's the supply ships. The flotillas of each ship uh, would be a well at sea before the invasion of Fo Poland. I would buy a cruiser from a country for show to flag diplomacy. Instead of building cruisers, I would build a flotilla of 9 to 10 destroyers for each capital ship based on US design for range, given excess of 5,000 nautical miles range, as well as one fast supply ship per capital ship. Based on 29th May 1937 air attack on the Deutschland, I would prioritize a dual purpose 5 inch or better gun for the destroyer, as well as better close in AA guns. Destroyers would have to have 5 to 6 guns and serve the German Navy like tribals. 
I would finish the aircraft carrier. Stress building, very good long range destroyer flotillas and submarines. Each flotilla gets a resupply ship. I would develop a two person auto gyro for scouting. Each flotilla would have two. Lastly, build six long range fast trawlers like the Soviet spy ships to shadow and film the RN. It sounds a good idea. I'd have to say the most interesting one is the other is the last point. I haven't considered that before. Long range fast trawlers. Get them flagged as Norwegian. I have them even bring in some fish occasionally. That could work. As to Azurus, uh, this is on the Emperor Hirohito gives tacit approval for Pearl Harbor. Same face for the Emperor. If the trick did not play well, Yamato was to take responsibility for acting his own. Yep. Yeah, I have to admit, this was one of the fun things I did find with the uh, Russian Marshals, in that one of them I found three different pronunciations for one of their names. Just to, just to confuse me more. Todd Webb, thanks for the subscribe speech, because I noticed I was somehow not subscribed, even though I'm rather certain I have subscribed before. YouTube does seem to do this, so please, if for all your people you watch and you like, if you have noticed you're missing their videos or something, check your subscriptions. Even if you're watching their videos, check your subscriptions, because YouTube does seem to unsubscribe some people sometimes. Web, something I don't recall, and this is on the Washington Cheaties Can't Response video. Um, something I don't recall anyone but could have great fitted for, but not with, would be torpedo launchers. I mean, picture having Brooklyn number of guns and torps. That could be useful. That could be useful. Soviet Navy again, 1918 to 1939. Uh, Simon Bionani, also openly hated but, uh, to Jurevsky. Um, to Jurevsky. But he was a horse cavalry officer and refused to even acknowledge the idea of tanks replacing cavalry as fast maneuvering units. He has been credited with having Tukhachevsky um, killed. Given the atmosphere of time, one marshal was whispering to Stalin that one of his fellows in disloyal wouldn't be surprising. Mikhail uh, Tukhachevsky has long been credited with the idea of deep battle, also called Operation Warfare. If you want an example of what that looks like, look no further than the Operation Desert Storm. Move fast, strike hard, give the opposition no time to react, and shape the battlefield to suit your operational mission in service of the strategic goals. He and his ideas would have been extremely dangerous as the Russians went on to the offensive. Would have made the Red Army even more dangerous than they become. Agreed. From me. I didn't want to get too much into him as he didn't have much to do with the Navy. But I think if I was ever asked to do a what-if video on Russia, what if the Great Purge hadn't taken out or generation officers, rather like what if all those Royal Navy admirals hadn't died just prior to World War II, the difference could have been very interesting. And for those wondering, yes, a lot of Royal Navy officers seem admirals seem to have a very high mortality rate in about 1938, 1939 and 1940. There is a very high mortality rate amongst senior Royal Navy officers. This causes quite a lot of problems. Ah, uh, oh yeah, Bugot. I figure then that was a who previously commented. I figured they sure people would have like a bit more of the story. It's a shame that what Stalin did to the Soviet military because of ego and paranoia. It's what most dictators do because of ego and paranoia. To you guys here as well, were large German surface units overweight for their capabilities because they had a distributed armor scheme, or was there something else weird going on? No, German surface units were just terribly built. Absolutely, horrendously, and efficiently built. Mainly because there are lots of people who want to add things onto them, and no one who can say no. And they would have entirely different sections for things which didn't need an entirely different section. And this means you have more crew, you have more redundancy built into the system than you need. And this is coming from me, who likes redundancy in the systems, but there is a point at which the redundancy is redundant. Because if you're now using the third or fourth backup system to do something, the odds are you're in... Uh, and they have three or four backup systems for some things which... Frankly, you didn't need them because if you're at the level of you using the fourth backup for that, you've got a lot more other problems going on in the first place. 
I if you're on the fourth backup of I don't know your oh they had once one of them they actually had alternative shower sections for personal cleanliness and that's great but that adds water tanks etc and all sort of and heater units all over the ship which you don't need to sort out it's not really good Do you guys hear on Hipper class is a couple, just a couple of thousand tons shy of World War One British or Invincible class battle cruiser in displacement. Yep, and I know which one I prefer to be on in a fight. No, it's not the Hipper. If you'd had the Invincibles around and modernised them, they would have really had a fun time with the German heavy cruisers. John Hargreaves. Ah, oh, again, this is Soviet 1930, 1918 to 1939. When the Romans wanted to make an example of a legion they had to disappoint, that had disappointed them, they was in charge. They decimated them, i.e. one in ten of them was murdered. Crucified, probably. Um, sometimes, sometimes they're just all ki they're just ki they're killed by the other, me other nine members. So you divide it up into groups of ten, and they draw lots, and the one who got the desired lot gets killed by the others. The Romans were an autocratic dictatorship, but they had a pragmatic common sense not to remove over 90% of their best officers. Stalin read history, but did not understand or distorted his understanding like many dictators still do now. They really don't learn from history, do they? Regards. Also, I would say, with the decimation of legions, it's amazing how the officers tended to survive. And the annoying troops who caused trouble and were the barrack room lawyers tended to be one who's, ones who died. So it's, it's amazing. It's just... it's. I, I'm I'm sure it's entirely by fate, by the will of the gods. After all, it's it's done by lot. See, Richard, if the German gets one aircraft carrier built, what do they use for escort ships? Um, if the rest of the build doesn't com build completed doesn't change, then probably hopes and prayers is my response. But maybe they go to the uh, they go to major task force route, and that will probably be the most sensible. The major task route force route would be you take a Deutschland class. Probably Deutschland herself, which by this point is called Lutzau. You add in a Scharnhorst and a, Tur and a Bismarck or a Tirpitz, and you have the carrier. And that's your force. If you can get a pair of Scharnhorst and a Deutschland, that's great. That's, it's not going to be a particularly fast moving force the moment you add in the Deutschland, but basically. Although it's not going to be that fast for the carrier. My coach, if, as you say, the Germans planned on war with France, with Britain staying neutral, then did the cruiser policy make more sense if that prediction had come to pass? France, facing only the Marine Nationale and not the might of the RN, would the German cruiser force make a greater strategic sense? Not really, as the French actually have a cruiser force and could outbuild them. After the Italian alliance in 1939, maybe it works, but still difficult to see. And there is, of course, the fact that the French have some very, very interesting capital ships, which are interesting vessels. Nelsonic, one could say. Definitely mm, fast and well-armed. Lee Sandler, Panzer Chief with nine guns and about eight to ten of them threatening Atlantic and Arctic routes would have given the Allies issues. I can imagine Churchill going, Pokemon, gotta catch them all. Definitely. And nice things at Night of Light. Panzer Chiefs, Pocky Battleships, they're heavy cruisers, were a good idea for a navy under heavy restrictions to build any bigger capital ships. I decided to focus on commerce raiding, blockade running, and coastal defence rather than power projection. Blockading and sea, and sea domination through overwhelming force. If Germany had kept their pre-Nazi naval doctrine and adopted Admiral Donitz's plan for a 300 year boat fleet, Britain would have been driven to starvation and probably forced to make peace. Why? No, please let me explain why I say this. Because if you're building 300 submarines, the Royal Navy's going to notice. So what is the Royal Navy going to do? Sit there and go, well, you're building 300 submarines. The, the, the Germans at many points in World War II do have 300 submarines actually operational. They're going for more than 300 submarines. 
and they have a hundred submarines and they have all sorts of things actually out in the Atlantic. The point is, what do the British respond? They respond by building corvettes. They know what to do. So if you have built, if the Germans have started building up a mass submarine force and not building cruisers, then the Royal Navy would have been ordering more sloops because under Article 8 of the Washington Treaty and all sorts of, well, under the Washington Treaty, the London Treaty, all these things, Article 8, had allowed them to build as many sloops as they could. As long as those ships were less than 2,000 tons, couldn't do more than 20 knots, couldn't carry torpedoes, weren't fitted to carry torpedoes, and didn't have more than a certain number of gun, uh, a certain number of guns over three inches, they could build as many as they liked. And that's what they would do. So if you're suddenly, if Germany announces they're suddenly building, or they see with their intelligence, Germany's building a lot of submarines. Oh, really? Uh, what's that sloop design we've got? Agret class? Yeah. Build. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. That is the point. In fact, the, this is another thing. The, the, the Germans were still building up their submarines when World War II starts. And the British start building the Corvettes, the flyer class, before World War II begins. So before World War II begun... They watch the Germans. They know the Germans have plans to build more submarines. This is in peacetime. They are ordering the flower class Corvettes. That is exactly what happened. So if just put that a few years earlier, and that's the British response. But Hitler wanted a new high seas fleet. That may obviously would have been a big waste of time, money, and resources, as proved by what happened in the Great War. The Panzer chiefs supported by friendly U-boats would have been a terrifying force to reckon with. Not really. They were always going to be in a problem. Because the British can always build more. Because the British have infrastructure. So the British can always... It's an infrastructure battle. And the Germans can't fight it. Unless they can change the modus of operandi of, of naval warfare. Away from needing the infrastructure. Unless they could find a way... If they could have combined their submarine force with... I don't know, long lance torpedoes. And actually built something like the Type 21 earlier maybe they can do that but if you look at especially if they start the construction earlier what are they going to start off with building the type 7a's they're not as good as the later ones this is the other problems if you move back the mass construction of submarines earlier the actual difference between the quality of what Britain can build in terms of sub hunter Versus the quality of submarine the Germans can build because they are rebuilding their technology and their infrastructure and something so they can build better submarines gets a bigger disparity. Oh. Kill an Ottoman on HMS Renown short. Who would win? All the battleship guns, none of the armor, versus all the armor, none of the guns. I guess Renown versus Shanhorse answer that. Um, the armor will hold it off for a certain amount of time, but then it will fail. If you don't have guns, you will lose. Armor doesn't make you invulnerable to weapons. It makes you able to resist the first or second, a first, possibly even second hit, but the third one will paint over, go through if it hits in a similar sort of area. Because of the damage it will do. During the nine gun Panzer Chief sounded very much like the O class battlecruisers with 28 centimeter guns in place of 38 centimeter guns. Considering the O's lack of armor, it seems like more of a 28 centimeter armed version of them, along with maybe five 38 centimeter armed Scharnhorst and no Bismarcks or H bars, would appear to have been a much more, lot more sense in mission and available infrastructure. Yep, that's why I put it forward. Drakenrad, the impression I have is the German Navy needed the US two Ocean Navy Axe funding. Yes, and probably a little bit more than that to get over the fact the USN has a much higher baseline to start off of from terms of experienced personnel, infrastructure, industry, all the other things they have. Okay, uh, next one. Paul Barnes. Drakenfell, you are not. Nah. He's my best friend though, so I'm glad you like his channel. Uh, Ariane Contreras. Dr. Clark, do you think the Soviet Navy should have had more 180mm gun cruisers, or was it that the Soviets made a right call in constructing cruisers with 152mm guns? I like the 180mm. Pardon me. I 
I think that was a good choice. Don't shovel food down quickly, you'll make you burp. No matter how tasty it is, don't. Um, apologies. The Graham 1973. The image of the Shan Horse turret captioned, It's not just 11 inch guns, immediately brought to mind the climax of naval action novel Rendezvous at South Atlantic by Douglas Uman, which features a German cruiser named Minden. Research from the description of the novel is a triple 8 inch mini Shan Horse. One does have to speculate. If the Germans would have been better served using the Scharnhorst and models of the cruiser, their cruisers rather than the Bismarck. Honestly, they didn't. It would the Scharnhorst would have been sensible to carry on, but they they weren't using really using the Bismarcks as the model. They were just that's what they were building because that's what other people had. And they they honestly, the German politicians when they get involved, are just seem to be constantly copying everyone else. It's one of those really sad things. The Japanese get accused of copying everyone else, but they don't. The Germans get held up as this sort of really innovative people, and honestly, they spend more of their time copying other people and going, What are they doing? Oh, it's... The, the Japanese are trying to build a navy which suits them. The Germans are trying to keep up the Joneses. Um, as the comment the Deutschlands were the backbone of the fleet, another author, naval fiction, Jay MacDonald, long-running author of the pulp naval fiction, featured modified Deutschland-class ships in several of his models. The main change being swapping out diesels for turbines to give a higher service speed, giving the books they appear in as somewhat between 30 and 32 knots. That would have definitely scared the living out of the British. Would 8 to 10, 9 gun... Panzer Chief have affected the course of the war compared to the historical fleet composition and capability. Doesn't seem like they counterbalance the RN advantages of obviously infrastructure numbers. Now, in terms of combat capability, it's the same. In terms of impact on RN operations and German strategic resource allocation, it would achieve more. There's a reason for this. There's nothing you really can do without making the Navy number one resource focus to change the outcome of the first point, though. Due to the reasons you stated, the British had too great an advantage. So basically, it gives you more of an effect of what you... It gives you a better version of what you already produce. Doesn't actually give you a winning option, because there is no winning option. Casey Limbert. Plotist, the British built the wrong kinds of ships to throw the Germans off into copying them so the British could blow them all up later. Last and British. I wish we'd been that kind. I wish we had been. Ralph, the idea of a mass-produced nine-gun Deutschland is pretty cool, come to think of it. Also kind of changes my perspective on the scout cruisers. I used to absolutely hate them, but if they did use them as long-range destroyers, then suddenly they make a lot more sense. Plus the turret layer is the same as Japanese destroyers. Also, that reminds me, the more I think about the German battleships, the stranger they get. It's like they couldn't decide if they were designing a battleship or a battlecruiser. The Bismarck's a pretty good battlecruiser, in my opinion. They got tremendous range. This huge armor layout makes them quite resistant to cruiser gunfire. They split secondary battery, lets them engage both ships and aircraft if they come across a convoy protected by an escort carrier, which don't exist when it's being designed, but could have a fleet air carrier escorting them. And they got those hydrophones to give them some warning of submarines out of destroyer squad. The H-39s take it even further by thinning down the armour, adding all the range, and carrying all those reconnaissance seaplanes. It's like they couldn't decide if they wanted the fighting ships or raiding ships. I think they wanted raiding ships, but they thought they were building fighting ships. Or at least that's what they dressed them as. Merkava ma'am, I would love to see you do a video on the Graf 7. Just the sheer amount of British rage would be hilarious. It sort of exists. So as close as I am to doing it, and I have put a link under in, in the cruiser policy, the Kreis Marine, Reichs Marine and Kreis Marine. If you go down that video, you will find my response. I've added a link to it. Um, the video was... Let me open it up and check it. Aircraft carriers 1920s and 30s. Um, Long Patrol Part 5 French and German Carriers Yeah Double whammy For my blood pressure That was that. That's a interesting video um, Interwar and World War 2 German naval engineering was a marvel Thank you Jack Ray It was a marvel how inefficient and poorly they designed ships I still wonder where the extra weight on the Bismarck and Hitler classes was spent And if it's as, 
It's as if after the flimsy cruisers like the Konigsberg, they decided to just make things thicker instead of designing things with proper stress calculations with less bulk. It's doing the stress calculations, okay? They lost a lot of institutional memory not building ships for that time. They also lost a lot of people. They weren't training them. The people who were naval architects, if you're a good naval architect and you design warships in Germany during uh, after World War One, where do you go? Do you stay in Germany? You're going to be employed there. No. You might go to Japan. They did employ some. You might go to Italy. They did employ some. Everyone nicked a few. The British nicked a few. The Americans nicked a few. Think of what happens to uh, after World War II to Germany in terms of the brain drain. Make it slightly less Cold war -y, and that's what you have going on. Because these people have a choice. Starve, find a new career to work in something else, in which case they're going to lose all their institutional memory, or go and work elsewhere. And so that's what they did. Fukov? Fukov, I think? I think? Can you do a Schnellboat episode? There is so little information about those amazing boats on the internet. I bought a book on Amazon and it's not very good. I wish I had an S boat. I'd take it on Detroit Measure and mess around with the, uh, those, um, uh, the rich people with their fancy boats that purposely try to tip me on wake when I'm fishing with my kids. I think actually you'd prefer a dog boat for that. There is a reason for this, okay? The Chanel boat is lovely. It's fast and it looks cool. But if you want to start tipping other ships over, the gunboat version of the dog boat will do a lot more damage. And there are some videos in the small boat section which are about them and which do have details about them. But I think the dog boat's a better route for you. And in which case, if you're looking for a good book, which also actually has good stuff about the Chanel boats in because they were their enemy. They were the two boats which fought each other. I do love this fact that one's called the Schnell boat and one's called the Dog boat. It really does reveal something about the nations which are sending them into war that, you know, one is called that and one is called the other. Oh, where have I put it? I had it. I was reading it literally five minutes ago. I mean, well, before I started recording the video, I was reading it. Oh, it's got to be around here somewhere. This looks so inefficient, but no, it was literally in my hands. Where did my dog boat book go? I've done many reviews on it, but it's, it's here. It is here somewhere. It is probably staring at me now as we speak. It will be staring at me. It will be watching me and going, ha 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 ha, I have fooled you again. I am invincible. Or I am invisible. Whichever one it prefers. Mm, not there. Not there, not there, not there. Where is. I put it down under something heavy because it was getting. starting to get bent out of shape because I've been reading it so much lately. For any worries, anyone worries, I just picked that one up. I remember it. But no, it's it's Dog Boats at War is a very good book. It's a very, very good book. And it will tell you a lot about the small share options, and it's somewhere in this room staring at me. It is. I'll probably finish this video and find it. That's bugging me now. It was, I was literally reading it. Oh, there it is. Dog Bites of War. By Leonard C. Reynolds. I think you'd enjoy that one. <sighs> Ethan McGinney. If you want to know about Hitler's logic, read Tooze's A Wages of Destruction. I've read it. It's interesting. It is the essential book for understanding Nazi war economy. Not quite sure about that, but it's certainly a good intro introduction to it. Mainly because, yeah, there are we there are parts which I think are just really beyond Tuz's scope. 
um, economy and internal logic of many Hitler's, Hitler's decisions and of other parts of Nazi RFRs. It also explains why Nazi Germany simply wasn't going to build better cruisers or enough of anything to matter. Yeah, there are many, many problems with them. Uh, Richard Gray, the bureaucratic competition wasn't just the Navy. It was intentional as part of Nazi philosophy. Hitler truly believed that the struggle made you stronger. So he set up the country with competing bureaucracies to fight each other on the belief that it would produce the best result. And as a result, Germany competed itself into losing faster than they needed to. So, no complaints. Sadly enough, true. Oh, well, good enough, true. It's, it's one of those interesting things. Stafford Thompson, I have now reached your comment on the Mary Celeste. Um, short. Thank you for the comment. I am not reading it out, because... We don't need that. Ang Alex Magnus. The atrocious singing will continue until morale improves. Oh, I'd love that, but no. I have actually got... I have now, when I do compiled videos, I do have an introduction, and I'm working out how to include them in XSplit. So far, every time I've tried to use the introduction video I filmed in XSplit when I'm putting it together... It hasn't worked, and so I have to now do a sort of modification where I take the video, and if I want to add in the introduction, I don't have to add it on in front and compile it together. And it doesn't always work that well. So I've got to figure this out. I, I will get that. I will get that. I've got something now. Tom's end and end there. Uh, hi, Doug C. Nice comment on Draken and his tries to get the name of the old pre dreads right. As a German, this is a bit of funny. Schelsig Holstein. Schelsig Holstein. And it's just luck of the draw that I can do it, but I do have an advantage. I ha My German teacher, when I was at school, when I was allowed to do German, before they basically said, well, you're dyslexic, so you have to give it up because, you know, you'll never do well in your GCSEs because of dyslexia, so we ca you can't do foreign languages. And that was really strange because I wasn't. I will, I will admit I wasn't the strongest in German and French, but I was doing quite well in Latin, and I had to give that up. Just a case of hmm. anyway. Our teacher was Austrian, our German teacher, and um, so she used to actually make us practice Schleswig Holstein and various other places in Germany as a way to try and learn the accent. So that's why I'm good at it. Literally, it's that. Ich habe zwei Hund, eine Pudel, eine Gorgi. P.S. Good summary about the sale of German cruisers. About the German building a 9 by 11 inch 30 knot cruiser. How would the UK react to that? As you need some fast heavies to deal with such a radar. All battleships and convoy guards are given, but the Open Ocean, a full cruiser squad, would be the only option or a carrier. Honestly, it's an interesting scenario of what you would get to happen, but I think the Germans could probably have justified it and got away with it. Because they're replacing the P-Dreadnoughts and they're armed with 11-inch guns, and British do have battle cruisers. But I wouldn't be surprised if the British changed the upgrade policy, in that you would probably get Renown, Repulse, and Hood upgraded earlier on, and you might also get a policy that some of the... While well, some of the Queen Elizabeths got the upgrade of armour and secondaries instead of more boilers to give them more speed there might have been more of a debate as to whether or not they should have a higher speed um, that's just what will go through my head on it fight for a global first minimum hello and remember i'm going to do these I'm going to do an hour and keep doing an hour as i work through them there are a lot. I haven't even got past. I haven't got past the cruiser policy of the Kriegsmarine, uh, Kriegsmarine, and Kriegsmarine, which were literally the first three videos yet, and I'm 40, 50 minutes into the first video, and that was like the third video of the Christmas series. So, yeah, th th this could be a lot of videos. Me going through the Christmas comments. Um, that's o'clock. Pre-war, Great War naval treaties. Would anyone have signed up, and could you get the Germans, Russians, French, Italians, the Japanese to agree to the exact same limitations? I mean, a German naval concentrated in the Baltic would be able to take on both Russia and France, which gives the Royal Navy a buff on the Baltic, North Sea, but it keeps the German Navy from challenging the Royal Navy if we could keep it focused on Russia and France. The Italians would be a buffer in the Med against the French, and the Saturday, 12 cavalry ships, 24 armored cruisers, 36 protected cruisers, destroyers, and torpedo boats uncapped. 
That'd be a four capital units per fleet for Russia, France, and six between the two German seas, and enough cruisers for imperial, colonial, and trade defense. Um, France and Russia may seem to be at a disadvantage, but neither could really afford anything more, and the infrastructure possibly not capable of building, uh, or either building or maintained operation of that many large ships. Is this is a reasonable, feasible, or is it a 2020 historical fantasy vision? Uh, sadly, it's fantasy vision. Because any war will be over by Christmas, right? And the recent video I've done where I did a whole work through of a scenario where they tried to avoid Belgium. And there are many people trying to pick out the pick to get. This is what I find funny. People are concentrating on trying to pick apart the plan of avoiding Belgium. And I'm going. And the question was, what would happen if you did avoid Belgium? This is this is not a good plan. There is a reason they chose to go through Belgium, and the reason they chose decided the risk was justified. But if you're deciding absolutely you're not going through Belgium, and you're not going through the Netherlands, which you decide already is part of the Shetland plan, and you can't go through Switzerland. And you can't go through the French forts. Your two options are a suck the French army in and destroy them in Germany, which the German army doesn't do because they go offensive. They always attack. They always attack. Or the operation I put, which is an amphibious operation, to go round Belgium. Those are your options. It's not a good option. It's not, there's a reason they don't do it, but it's the only other option. And the thing is, as I've pointed out in some response to comments, Kaiser Wilhelm is just about stupid and naive enough to believe that if he phones the king of the king of England and tells the king, "Ah, oh, we are just going to attack the French. We are not sending up an amphibious force, etc., to attack Britain. No, no, no. We're not going to attack you." Just about stupid enough to believe that he could get away with that, and that the British would believe him. Just about. And if you're wondering what I, eat, I ate so quickly earlier, I got some chicken. Very nice. It's all gone. Um, the victory over... Oh, no, no. Actually, I missed a question. Uh, I'm just distracted by the a cool name. Marcus Frontonium. History can only set in perspective if all facets of political, culture, and economic aspects are read. Something people largely forget in researching history. After looking at the fleet of the Germans they had in 1940, it would be the wet dream of the Dutch, as when looking at the fleet, law, and doctrines, they are spot on with the numbers. They would be very happy to take over the German fleet. The light cruisers were not unlike the Deuter class, same armour, two more guns. What well, if we read on Dutch plans for a fleet in the German Navy in 1938-39? Three British Shell battleships are class more likely. Three battle cruisers, three heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, three flotilla leaders, 24 destroyers, 48 disgust, and 36 submarines. Yes, it would have been the wet dream for the Dutch, but not really that useful for them, actually, if you consider the way the German fleet was orientated. Uh, victory over himself. That's an interesting one. I think the politicians just wanted cruisers that looked a bit more like capital ships from shore if you squinted, because they couldn't possibly manage to rebuild the high seas fleet. Just for the sake of prestige, let's be honest, fully half the point of a navy, having a navy. Yes, yes, I can see your point, but then you can make them look like better. You can, you can make them look like better battleships. Honestly, the two turrets for one aft, Scharnhorst style arrangement sort of scenario, it would have been good. Richard Order, for some reason he went to Patron 50, the 1939 destroyer com a doctrine of combat navies, and where did it come from? <laughs> I am not answering your first question, because that might give people ideas. Uh, Canadian's War. Oh, sorry, we burned your city down. Shouldn't we? Uh, shouldn't have uh, went to war against us, eh? Oh, des sol, que nos ayons brûle votre ville. Je n'aurais pas du pâté en guerre contre nous, hein? Forgive the bad pronunciation of your French uh, of your French translation. I seem quite good. Um, no, the fluffy research assistant does not want a warm brawl of Iron Brew. He actually does try and drink my Iron Brew. Please note, both the Corgi and the Poodle will try and drink Iron Brew, especially if it's cold. And the Corgi, I've got a picture of somewhere of him running around with a can of 1901 in his mouth, which he nicked out of the mini fridge. On the in a, in a cottage we were staying in, and he was running around the house in the 1901 as well, going. He was incredibly happy. 
The poodle was incredibly unhappy because the poodle was being held on lead and couldn't also go after it. <laughs> oh. Decision. It seems like a fundamental function of a friendly government is inefficiency. They need to create perceived strength and decisiveness, prevents the discussion and refinement that allows efficiencies to be found. So I guess you couldn't have a third right that doesn't chase the Plan Z dragon. Mm, sadly enough, not. I do wonder what the British response would be. Um, maybe why my Republic journey could do that as a way to balance better resource revivals? Mm. You need a way to hunt them down, which requires both firepower and numbers. Do you get a world where Britain dumps the treaties to build a fleet of 26 by 16 inch, maybe all forward battle cruisers, to do their original economic warfare role and hunt those German ships? Would it change the strategic calculus as suddenly every other battle fleet is having to abandon the idea of a big fleet for the Soviet battle to instead compete in the numbers? I think you get a two tier navy for the Royal Navy. And let me explain this. If you've got the Germans building these ships, and yet they need battleships to fight the Japanese, I think you get large cruisers. Now, the question is whether those large cru whether you do a policy of those large cruisers getting 9.2-inch guns, which breaks the treaty, but when you're just saying, look, the Germans are building 11-inch cruisers, we need, a nine we need a something which can match in against it. Might get your way, might allow you to get away with it, and that's your super cruiser. And you're building your 14 inch battleships, as historically you do, your King George V's. Or, and this is the other option, you build. And you build some basically fast battle cruisers. Which might be adapted sort of F3 designs with maybe two triple turrets forward, only just six guns, rather than a nine, 14 inch. So you build 16 inch battleships and you build some 14 inch, basically modeled on Dunkirk's to an extent. Um, Dunkirk's uh, are designed to be as fast as possible to go where they need to go. It's an interesting idea, and I'm saying this based on my own reading of the various German, uh, various British, and German discussions. So nothing which was planned, but the, some of the discussions the British had, especially in terms of ship design in the Admiralty and in the Sea Lords Committee, it would be seem possible as an option for the go that route. The 14 inch gun is a compromise, but they know that the, but Chatfield is really obsessed with using it. I think if Henderson could have come up with a justification to divert it off into some sort of smaller ship, i.e. instead of Vanguard, the fast battleship program is the ships armed with two triple or maybe even three triple turrets. And basically, they do a scale version. They do a nine-gun battleship with nine 16-inch guns, and they do a battle cruiser variant with nine 14-inch guns. I, th I think that could be, well be there's something they do. I feel real. It should come as no surprise that uh, whatsoever that I have a bit of soft spot for Red Storm Rising, given a large part of it is set in Iceland. For the date it is written, it's accurate enough, even if the stand Icelandic farmhouse described in it really isn't. Also, saying you need to plant trees in concrete to get them to stay put is a slight exaggeration. You probably could guess this. Yes, but I only think it's a slight exaggeration. I think you, whilst you don't need to plant them in concrete, you probably do need to ensure that they have some kind of concrete windbreaker while they're growing. Because once they're established trees, you're fine. But when they're whip thin growing up, I, I, they do need a lot of protection in Iceland, from my experience. Mm. Stewald. While I have seen the battleship Plumpkin before, after reading Red Storm Rising as an undergraduate, I went to Sir, Sir Guillain Eisenstein Film Festival as a local theatre. Dr. Clark's description of mutiny being sparked by the rotten food brings up images from the damned the defiant, with the sailor being compelled to eat the bread with the worms and starting mutiny early. 
and Dirk Bogard as the sadistic exec abusing the crew while not minding the captain. I think that he was influenced by the dark side. There are problems. You do not not fe feeding not feeding a crew properly is a quick way to lose control of your ship. And the British and the American navies learnt this early on, and so did the French and several other navies. And the Russian Navy did know it for a while. The Russian Navy in the Age of Sail would have never tolerated some of the things that happens in the Age of Steam. It's amazing. When the Russian Navy in Age of Sail is very much second to the army and very much no prestige and no one really wants to be part of it, it's very professional and it's very capable and it very much doesn't do these things. The moment it starts to gather prestige and luster and you get these people joining, it gets all this problem. Alan Kong, I'm not sure you can blame the Deutschen class in the on Nazi totalization, considering the class were designed by the Weimar government. I don't. I say there's a problem with the Weimar government as well as the Nazis. I think the Nazis just make it worse with cruisers. I also don't think it's fair to compare them to regular heavy cruisers when they're specifically limited by treaty as a placement for all pre dreadnoughts Yeah, they are, though. And they're filling the heavy cruiser role. That's the role they're being outlined and aimed for. So that's their comparable class. You can't you can't make a shit class and go, well, they're a standalone class, and they're therefore we can't compare them to anything. No, you have to compare them. But then you go by what's their role, and you compare the other ships which are doing that role, which are heavy cruisers, and you compare them to the heavy cruisers' performance at a role, and you go, well, you good or not? Why does everything the Germans make make need to specifically be about counter and a Royal Navy? The Germans never build, can never build the ships in the quality or quantity to do so. I think Germany saw the French as their main rivals, mostly in the war environment. Which is what I point out. They start off with the French, but then eventually they come to fight, countering the Royal Navy. And that's the Germans, because the Germans are building it to that moment. That's what Plan Z is about. That is what the Navy law is about prior to World War I. The Germans inexorably are drawn towards countering the Royal Navy. Why? Because they're the biggest at this time. And the Germans want to be the biggest. Remember, it's the whole of World War One and World War Two to an extent are long-running fight over who gets to be in the next global superpower, or rather, the next global power. We we define a superpower as something newer with nuclear weapons, but a global power there has often been there has often been a preeminent global power during. The voyages of a very uh, an admiral a long, long time ago, you could probably argue the Chinese were the global power. They stepped back from that. And honestly, that was always a choice to do it. It was always not a necessity for them to be a global power. Then there was a long time, different struggles. The Spanish were it for a while... Portuguese could be argued to be fairly high up there. Uh, the Dutch, the French, the British all compete for it. The British come out of it. The British maintain it because their entire system is based on being it. And World War One is about, and World War Two, and the period between are about the transition. And it's a tradition of who's going to be the next global power. Who's going to be the person who sets the conversation tone and discussion tone? Who is going to be? the nation which people talk about as the world's policeman. America's what, the one that comes out of it, but there are lots of powers competing for it. Don't think it's just Germany, but Germany is aiming for it, and Britain's the one which has the crown at that time. So Britain's their target, and that's why you have the comparisons. Drake, Chilean wine, and Valparaiso. Ooh. Now I want to know how the current singer Drake winds up in the Spanish. He could do a concert in Gibraltar, was the suggestion from Ryan Tyler. Phil Van Lent. Don't know. Never heard of him. Is he bad? I think he's actually quite good. Um, but I base this on my little cousins actually knowing who he is. Andrew Cox. We are building the biggest, meanest, nastiest cavalry ship we can build. I said no one on the King George V project. It wasn't just the Kriegsmarine fighting politically inspired requirements. Yeah, this is the other problem. People sometimes take it, when I'm critiquing people, they'll often go, oh, you're just being jingoistic for Britain. Um, 
if you want to hear how jingoistic I am for Britain, please look at any of the videos where I talk about the King George Vs. Andrew Cox, engineeringly perfect is an interesting concept which I'm pretty sure doesn't exist, and I say that as an engineer. Joseph Eskins, as a fellow engineer, perfect does not exist. Honestly, the thought of getting anything perfect is ludicrous, especially when anything can and will be improved as technology advances, needs change, and abilities need to fully focus. Hence why good enough is a much more suitable and reasonable objective. After all, good enough may not be perfect, but it's enough to do the job. Mm hmm. Oh, Arthur M. Responding to talk of the Battle of the Oliver. Oliver. Um, I pronounced it Oliver. Uh, but it's Oliver, apparently, because he's nice to see someone talk about his battle in English. Side note, though, the letter W is pronounced in Polish and in some other languages, including German, like V is in English. But as I said, when I pronounce it like Oliver, it sounds like Oliver, which is the name of my Polish friend who actually taught me a little Polish, but still sounded wrong to my mind. It's a, this is the trouble. This, I know it. I, I mentally do know it is Oliver. Oliver. But it spelled Oliver, and if I pronounce it Oliver, it sounds like Oliver. So it's just it. I, 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 I'm sorry. Another one of Cruiser Policy, the Kriegsmarine, or Rexmarine, Kriegsmarine, Kriegsmarine, Pottery. Mm. Frank Damaris, I might pay money to see that Cartier showed on the Baltic between the Graf Zeppelin and whatever the Soviets called theirs. If the Soviet air group is as inappropriate as the German one is going to be, we might finally see a gun duel between carriers and get to watch them bleed all over each other. Possibly, but HMS Formidable will be very sorry to miss if there's a, to not be part of it if there's a gun duel between carriers. Could be the only time in history there's a case of the, the Royal Navy's going. So what happened to for then? Well, Formidable, um, that the 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 the. Um, not responding at all to any of the sailors aboard on the wheel at all, uh, took herself into through the Denmark Straits, um, around around Sweden, um, and uh, then ended up in the in the middle of the gun duel between the uh, Soviet ship, uh, crew, uh, carrier and the Graf Zeppelin, and she sank them both. Why? Well, the Soviet one was in her way, and the, the Graf Zeppelin was her target. Do we have control of this errant carrier anymore? Yes, she's sailing back to where she came from. She came all the way out of the Mediterranean for this. We're not quite sure how she got past the Italians. And Force H. And possibly through the Channel. And... <laughs> but she seems to have been sailing very fast. Okay. Vandalin. This is the last one for this video. Chill new wine? I had no idea and I approve. If I can afford anything that doesn't come in a box that month and I've made it past the pretty pictures on labels of other wines, that's what they were there, they're there for, I buy Chilean. No Englishman of that age would buy French wine if they could steal Chilean from the Spanish. True. Right then. I hope you enjoyed this. As I said, I will work through the other questions. There are lots and lots of them. I will add something. So we've just done. We've been doing some maths and working out the 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 Australia trip, which is coming at the end of this year. Well, not at the end of the year, June. So I'm start giving some dates out for that. And broadly speaking, the trip is at the moment, and this is a draft plan. We haven't confirmed it because we haven't started the fundraising and haven't worked things out. But the draft plan is to be in Australia from roughly the 4th to the 25th of June. And roughly to visit Sydney, Brisbane, Victoria and Perth. We'll be flying in and out of Perth. That's how we reach Australia. 
I have to admit, I'm currently having a mi I, I will take suggestions for it, because currently... Well, we're going to be doing some fundraising for it, as I've said. I haven't... I've failed to get a grant this year. I can understand why um, I not, I'm neither fish nor fowl at this point, officially. I, I, I don't have a tenured post, and I've... I'm a long way I passed my PhD. So, I don't really fit in any of the funding categories, sadly enough. And I managed to get some funding last year, which was very, very good, thank you very much. So, we shouldn't be, I, I shouldn't be too upset, and I'm not. But, <laughs> premium economy, and please note, I realise that is above my station, I'm not, uh, but I don't want to fly economy to Australia, I really don't. I really want something slightly more comfortable. Uh, there is uh, premium economy. Singapore Airlines is what I'm currently looking at. Is three thousand nine hundred twenty pounds. So any suggestions on how to get these things cheaper would be great because the whole thing currently adds up to, and this includes. I have to admit, we've had, uh, we've added in something for my uh, in the draft. And I hope it's going to stay in. And Gareth certainly hopes it's going to stay in. Because it's basically, it's for me and Gareth, the two train buffs. We've added in the fact that after we finish in Sydney at the end, instead of flying back to Perth, we get the India Pacific. And we get the train from Sydney to Perth. <laughs> that is going to be interesting to try uh, to book. We have to book that soon if we're going to do that. And that will be about £1,350. I know, I know. I know it's bad. But I don't want to... It's a, it's 33 hours flying. I do not want to add on an extra flight your flight time from going, just flying from Sydney to Perth and then get, and waiting in the Sydney and Perth airport and getting on the plane and flying off again. It just... It, oh. No. 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 I don't want to do that. Um, so, these are sort of the plans we got going through. Uh, so yeah, there's that. So it, it's going to be good, but it's going to be expensive. So, uh, ideas for, um, fundraising, greatly received. Thank you for people who've already donated towards the trip. That money is being siphoned. I am putting that money off into a separate account, so I have it to go there. And... It's going to be a very good trip, but ideas would be greatly received. And, yeah. We're going to be announcing more details once we've got everything confirmed up. But, the things we're going to visit include, at the moment, the list include the Fleet Air Arm Museum in Australia, the Royal Australian Navy Heritage Centre, the Australian National Maritime Museum, of course. HMAS Vampire is going to be the highlight of the ship trip for me. But also seeing Jamie from Bill Trumps. We are going to... There is going to actually be a Bilge Pumps. With all three of the Bilge Pumpers. Actually together in the same room. You can be scared by that if you think. I, I'm scared. We might actually... Seriously. We will be sort of suggest, asking for suggested venues. For us to get together and... It does depend on whether Jamie feels like joining us in any of the trip, or whether Jamie is just going to go, right, the city you come to where I live is where we'll do it. We're happy either way. We'd love him to join the trip with us, but we do understand. He actually has a fa he actually has children and is a really great dad, so, you know. And has a day job, which doesn't always allow him to travel. But, yeah. We're going to be having... It's going to be a really cool trip. And it's all thanks to you. So, I wanted to add that on the end. But I also want to say... Suggestions, please. Suggestions, please. And after I've finished recording this... I will start recording the next one. So, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And take care.